Welcome everyone to our closing keynote presentation for this year's Evolving Enterprise event. I'm thrilled to welcome longtime friend of GGV, Susan St. Ledger, as our ending keynote. Susan is president of Worldwide Field Operations at Okta, the leader, leader in access and identity management for the cloud. And prior to joining Okta, Susan spent four and a half years at Splunk as president of Worldwide Field Operations, where she built a SaaS multi-product go-to-market organization and helped grow that business from nearly 700 million in revenue when she joined to almost two and a half billion today. Uh, previously, she spent more than 11 years at Salesforce in a number of leadership roles, and uh, most recently as Chief Revenue Officer of the Marketing Cloud. And prior to Salesforce, Susan was at Sun Microsystems, first as a systems engineer, she's actually very technical, and left as vice president of a global sales organization. Susan, it's great to have you here. Welcome, and thanks for being part of this event. Thanks for having me, Glenn. Always fun to join GGV. Great. So I wanted to start um, by asking you about leadership. Um, you've worked with some of the, the real, uh, in, in the technology, some technology industry, some of the world's most storied leaders, Scott McNeely, Mark Benioff, Doug Merritt, now Todd McKinnon. Um, and you've also been a leader yourself of several uh, very large go-to-market organizations. I'm curious, like, what qualities do you look for in great leaders? Um, and what skills do you think founders watching this um, and, and would-be founders uh, should be honing themselves to make sure that they are good leaders as they start to build their organizations? First and foremost, Glenn, I would say growth mindset. You and I have talked about this a number of times. And, you know, when I think about a growth mindset, I would look for people who are always learning, who are continuously improving, always focused on continuous improvement. No matter how well they do, they're always using hindsight to figure out how to do things even better. And then lastly, people who are comfortable being uncomfortable. So those are really the three pillars of a growth mindset. But when it comes to go to market, on top of that, the, the importance of that is that you're, you know, if you're starting up a, a company and you want it to be high growth, the stages are going to change very quickly. And so you need people who are resilient and who have open minds and continuously change. So that's that's why I focus on the growth mindset. But on top of it, I think you also have to make sure that you hire people who know what great looks like when it comes to talent. It's the most important thing your leaders do is hire great people. Mm -hmm. They get that right, everything else would be a whole lot easier. I also think that you have to look at the background at from go-to-market leaders, what have they sold? Um, have they sold things that were, you know, that were that took a lot of value selling, or did they sell things that were already established and really well known? For instance, were they selling Oracle database or and or Microsoft Office? They may not have had to be, you know, high value sellers, as opposed to if you're selling Oracle apps, that was a much harder sell because they didn't dominate the market in that space. So those are the, some of the things that I look for. Um, lastly, I would say, in a lot of cases, the startups are, you know, doing market creation, and doing market replacement is very different than market creation. And market creation is a lot harder. Once again, mm -hmm. tying back to how do you explain the value? And how do you go after budget that wasn't previously budgeted for? So those are all the things that I would say to focus on uh, as you're starting a go-to-market organization. Great, that's super helpful. Um, you know, I, I, your your um, thoughts around growth mindset really resonate with me. Um, we're obviously evaluating company leaders all the time, uh, and I feel like the very best people we've backed over the years are always folks who are voracious learners. Um, you know asking questions and um, trying to learn wherever possible and continually creating like new skill sets. Because as you say, the, the jobs change and when you're in leadership capacity and you're part of a growing company. Um, you know, particularly talking about go-to-market teams, um, founders are really often faced with the challenge of um, bringing in sales leadership, managing sales leaders, um, and, and having to try to make sure that those sales leaders flourish and like you say, those sales leaders oftentimes uh, themselves will then go hire lots of people. So that that decision on who you bring in to run a go to market organization can be really important for a founder of a company. Um, one of the things you've talked about, in addition to growth mindset, is something you look for yourself and people is people who've had pivots 
um, and manage those. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, I love looking for pivots on people's resumes because what it demonstrates again is that growth mindset and that and the ability to uh, learn. So what I'll generally do is take a look at somebody's resume and have they done the same thing over and over again, or have they made a, made a pivot? Such as I started as a computer scientist, then I became an SE. Eventually, I went into sales. I did customer success. And the reason I like looking for those is because. It, it just indicates that somebody is not afraid to take risk and also that they can take on something new and learn how to be successful at it. And so generally the way I will ask the question is, tell me about the greatest pivot that you've ever made. Mm. Um, how did you go about learning what you needed to learn to be successful? And it's a, it's a really fascinating thing to see that, you know, some people do it over and over again and some people have never done it. They, they've, you know, sold one thing to one type of audience their whole life and you know they get stuck, and so you you really want to look for people who who are who are not stuck and who are who have that growth mindset. You and I, um, uh, it's my good fortune to get the chance to work with you on the HashiCorp board, and you know as board members, um, we're oftentimes helping helping management evaluate new execs for company for you know in this case HashiCorp, but um, you know for 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 company leaders. Founders who are building out their teams, they're oftentimes interviewing and trying to evaluate potential leaders to bring on. I know you, you've done a lot of that yourself. Um, what are some of the tricks of the trade when you're trying to evaluate somebody new, like questions you like to ask people in addition to the pivot question? Um, when you're doing references, things that you can learn from references, how do you think about that? Sure. References are critical. And what I would say is make sure you ask for customer references. So not just references of people who have worked for them or people they've worked for, but definitely ask for customer references um, because great sales leaders will be able to supply you with many customer references. And also you'll be able to see at what level they're supplying those. Have mm -hmm. they had the ability, do they have the Rolodex to get to the CXOs that you likely want to get to when you're starting a company? And so um, that's one of the things that I look for. Um, the other thing is when I ask for references, I've always laughed because people say, well, you know, when you do reference calls, nobody's ever going to say anything bad. Everybody's going to give you the names of people who say good things about them. So when I talk to their references, if it's somebody who, you know, clearly is a, a strong executive or a strong leader, it says a lot about the fact that they're willing to be a reference for the candidate. Sometimes people give you um, references that, quite frankly, aren't that impressive. So references can tell you a lot, even if they're t even if they're going to say nice things about the person, who who they selected to be their references says a lot about that person. Also, sometimes I find how responsive they are. If they get right back to you and they really want to support the candidate, that's telling. If it's hard to reach them and they're slow to respond, that may be another signal. Yeah, it probably means they don't actually want to be a reference. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. This is super helpful. I'm thinking about uh, building out a go-to-market, um, but I want to talk about, you know, for, for startups, um, particularly those going after enterprise customers, um, this can be a hard challenge when you're a young company to kind of break the ice and get into selling to enterprises, um, uh, you know, getting those first few accounts um, and, then, and then hoping to have more dominoes fall from there. Um, what do you think are some of like the critical uh, things you need to do to try to ensure that you can have success early on when you're trying to sell to to enterprise customers? Well, certainly, um, you know, the founders themselves uh, have to be willing to sell. Uh, you know, they're the ones that that people are going to be betting on. And so I think in the early days, the founders have to do a lot of selling. Certainly, I saw Mark Benioff do a ton of that. Hmm. Um, you know, even now at Okta, the the person that I'm learning the most from in, in terms of customers is is Freddie, right? So Freddie's, uh, he's really the customer facing. Todd does a lot of customers too, but um, he's just out there, you know, constantly selling. And it's it's really um, important that the founders never never lose sight of that, but especially early on. The other thing I would say is, um, you know, try and find the repeatable profiles and patterns. Find those early adopters because it's it's getting those first couple of wins and then making those customers successful, leaning hard on customer success that will really help you create that domino effect. OK, um, it, it, it sounds like one of the other things um, I know you've mentioned in the past is um, senior execs that you may bring in like one thing to check on them is do they have Rolodexes? Do they have networks they can lean into 
um, you know, to try to get people over the hump of working with a startup? How important is that? It, it's incredibly important. Um, you know, when I was at Salesforce, there was probably nobody with a better Rolodex than Jim Steele. And uh, mm. I just watched him work that Rolodex and saw how important that was. And certainly have worked uh, for many years now establishing my Rolodex. And I think it's something to look for. And that ties back to the reference question, right? Who are they supplying? They should, if, if they're uh, selling into, let's say, the IT industry, they should be supplying you with CIOs and CISOs. You know, they should also be supplying you with CEOs. That would be references for them. So really, really important to understand who, the, who, who they have in their Rolodex. Sounds good. Um, you know, so there are a lot of companies that are facing that challenge of going after the enterprise. In a similar way, uh, many of the folks listening in today are also thinking uh, about bottoms up and starting more uh, with kind of like a product-led growth model and oftentimes going after smaller customers first, maybe someday with aspirations to go after after bigger companies. Um, and, you know, with the, with, the, with the more of the bottoms up motion, there are other things to think about. Um, and, and you've seen some of that in your career, uh, Salesforce and some of the work you helped engineer changes at, at, uh, at Splunk. Um, so curious, like, um, what you could say about bottoms up and how you'd contrast that with trying to build out more of an enterprise go to market. So, uh, you know, obviously bottoms up can be a great way to get started. Salesforce got started that way. Um, you look at you know, the success of a company like Atlassian and how successful they've been bottoms up. Slack was bottoms up. Um, but eventually most companies need to marry both. They need to have a bottoms up motion and they need to have a tops down motion. Um, you know, the nice thing about software as a service is it really has democratized the market so that you can serve both ends of the market. Um, I think most, most companies start bottoms up because the requirements are less uh, rigorous on the bottoms up side. Um, but the other really interesting thing that I see happening is, you know, with the shift to native cloud, um, that has driven, you know, the phenomenon of shift left, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so the developers have really become more and more and more important in this native cloud environment. It, it, developers have always been important, mm -hmm. but now because of the ephemeral resource, ephemeral nature of the resources spinning up and down in the cloud, you actually have to start to instrument your applications with security, with identity, um, you know, actually in the developer in the developer motion. And so I think it's really interesting that developers are, are gaining more and more importance due to the shift to the cloud. And so my personal belief is that most companies are going to have to have both a bottoms up and a tops down. And they're very different motions most of the time. Um, so for instance, if you're selling to devs one minute and then you're selling to the enterprise, you're probably gonna be selling to CIOs or CISOs. Those are two very different audiences. And that's why I say audience selling is something to test for. Don't hire somebody who has only sold to one audience their mm. same their whole life, unless that's the audience you're trying to sell to. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, it's been my experience that when you're trying, when, when developers are, are a, a part of your sales cycle, um, maybe they're not the budget holder, but they're the ones who are, you know, whose hearts and minds you, you may need to win with your product. Um, they, they're pretty fickle and can be very difficult. Um, and it seems like product at that point becomes at least as important as sales, but really marrying those two disciplines together and sometimes bringing in marketing as well, like really having those things linked well together are important. What have you seen um, so far uh, in, 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 in your own, in the companies you work at, companies you advise with respect to trying to tie more closely together um, that product and sales kind of motion and anything you could say there that might be helpful for, for younger companies thinking about how to make sure the bottoms up gets working. Sure. Well, for starters, um, you're absolutely right. It, bottoms up, it's all about the product. And quite frankly, if it's a dev environment, if it's if you're selling to devs, they don't want to be sold to. They just want to swipe their credit card. They don't want to talk to people like me. And so the net of it is they they just want to swipe their credit card and go. And what they, you know, that self-service is is so important for that bottoms up and any bottoms up motion, but especially the developer bottoms up motion. And then marrying that together with demand gen, right? So the, the link between um, filling that top of the funnel with mar marketing with the, the right campaigns and demand gen, and then knowing how to nurture through the funnel, it's, in, it's equally as important to have a strong CMO that understands how to treat different parts of the funnel with different types of campaigns. 
Um, and then the other thing is, of course, making sure that in your environment where you have your swipe, swipe your credit card and go, you become very data driven. You use that data to know how to nurture those customers. You know who your customers are and you know how to gradually upsell them. So that's mm. that's really important, too, is to make sure uh, when you're when you're using that motion, it has to be extremely data driven. Who's the keeper of the keys on the data um, or who would you recommend be kind of the driver of that? Is that the, should should marketing be kind of the quarterback of of all like data based decisions or is that more sales leadership um, or 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 whom is, is should there be a separate data organization or biz ops that kind of helps orchestrate everything? So, so done right, it's usually marketing as the initial keeper, the, the keeper of the data, but usually married um, very strongly with sales operations. Um, and, you know, that way they form the, they, they really understand the propensity to buy model mm -hmm. and, uh, and are targeting the right profiles. Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, a, a, a related question would be if you're setting up a go to market organization. Uh, bottom where where bottoms up is going to be at least uh, uh, an initial thrust for you. Um, should marketing? Do you think marketing should report to sales? Should marketing be a separate um, function that reports, you know, up into a CEO alongside sales? What have you seen? I, I'm sure there are pros and cons to each. What what? How, how would you be thinking about that if you were architecting a, a new organization? Sure, I think it really depends on the the experience of the people involved. If your sales leader has literally only done sales and hasn't run the other functions like customer success and marketing, I wouldn't put marketing underneath it, especially in a bottoms up motion. Um, but if you have somebody at a president level who has that experience, then it's totally fine to put the CMO under the president because it brings it together mm -hmm. uh, very closely with sales. And so um, the other option of course, is to have it underneath the CEO and what I would say there is I think it depends on how much of an operator the CEO is and how visionary the CEO is. Um, but it, it could really play either way. The, but the important thing is that the linkage between sales and marketing has to be, you know, it just it has to be unbreakable. And it can't be, you know, where I see things fail is when people are fighting over attribution, over whether something was like really came out of sales or whether the lead was sales generated or whether it was marketing generated, you have to get rid of all that nonsense. You need an attribution model so you know what's working and where to invest your money. But but fighting over attribution is just wrong. And if you get sales and marketing linked the right way, um, you know, you have none of that fighting over attribution. You're really just making sure that you're taking the data driven approach to the best way to conquer the market. I want to add even further further add complexity to this equation, another leg of the stool that that uh, another function that many companies are adding is, is sort of post-sales success um, and thinking about making sure that success works because in a, in a cloud-based model, you're relying on lifetime value to be high, which means you have to have good land and expand. You certainly can't, you have to have high retention. If you have a lot of churn, you're in trouble. Um, and so, post-sales success becomes more and more important. Um, curious, like any any views there on what's worked well for you in organizations you've helped run and manage on the success side? Um, I think they should be pretty data-driven as well, I would imagine. And, and then, um, you know, another question would be, again, like how do you make sure to sync up the efforts of a success organization? Should that report into, a, you know, um, sales or, or go-to-market um leadership or, or live on its own. Um, any comments there would be super helpful. Sure. Lots to talk about there. Um, so first of all, your success motion is equally as important as your sales motion. Um, and I think that, you know, I remember when I first got to Salesforce, customer success was really fairly new to the industry. And that's because software as a service was new to B2B, to, mm. to the B2B industry. And so Mark invested heavily in customer success early on, and it, it just proved to pay off. Um, you know, they always say it's easier to keep a customer than it is to get a new one. And, and so keeping a customer and continuing to, to grow their, their share of wallet and their the value that they have with you is, is very important. Um, what I would say is that uh, start that right away, because the more successful you make your early customers, uh, the, the more they're going to be willing to sell on your behalf. And, you know, when you're a small startup, customer references are invaluable. 
And so making sure that you make your first couple of customers incredibly successful and keep that motion going is, is incredibly important. We used to say at Salesforce that we were the only company that we knew that would put both our customers and our prospects in the same room with some alcohol. And so <laughs> they sold for us. And it was a phenomenon. I had never seen customers sell so hard for a company. Mm. And that was really amazing. And now you see that a lot in a SaaS environment because because these companies are investing to make their customers successful and therefore the customers are willing to lean in and speak on their behalf. So that's one. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, data-driven, 100%. Uh, you need to be focused on you know, net dollar retention. Uh, you need to make sure that you understand uh, your net new versus your upsell and, and your lifetime value of your customers. So there, there are many things within a customer success organization that you have to focus on. Um, to make sure that you don't have a leaky bucket, right? So net dollar retention is really important, but understanding, you know, how much is actually leaking out is is really really important. Because if you're selling, you know, if you're growing sales by fifty percent, but you're losing 10 percent of your customers every month or every quarter or every year, it's a problem. So definitely being data driven is key. And the nice thing again about SaaS, generally, hopefully your SaaS. Um, architecture is instrumented in such a way that you can actually see your customer success. You can see their adoptions, adoption. You can see what features they're using and what they're not. And that's the way your customer success organization, in order to scale, the more they can see within your environment digitally, just the usage. I'm not talking about seeing customer data. I'm just talking about seeing the usage patterns and, and what how, how customers are in the journey of adoption is, is really, really valuable. And then lastly, your question on where should it sit? You know, it's very common to have something called a chief revenue officer today. Mm -hmm. And the concept of that is if you if you really want one person owning all the revenue, then cut both customer success where renewals generally sits and sales rolls up to that that chief customer revenue, that chief chief revenue officer. And so I've seen it work where you can either have renewals in sales or if you have the right leadership and customer success, you can have renewals in customer success. But ultimately, it has to come together under one leader to make sure that you have one throat for, for revenue. So CROs um, you know, aren't born that way, right? And many CROs started as, as kind of sales leaders who've grown to take on these other functions. Um, and um, you know, for many startups, a big challenge is you... you it takes a while to find a good sales leader. And as you get bigger and realize like, wait, I've, I've got to start thinking about customer success and I've got to figure out if marketing should be under sales or, or under, you know, part of a, part of a broader go to market. Um, you know, should my current head of sales ascend to the CRO throne, right? Um, how do you, how do you know if someone's ready for that jump? Um, and, and how do you, you know, are there things you could do to help a sales leader grow into that role, um, and, and, you know, uh, successfully manage more than just sales, but the whole sort of customer life cycle? Absolutely. I would, I, the first thing I would say is when you look for your first sales leader, if you can find somebody who really knows how to sell, but really has great operational chops, that's the type of person that's going to be able to grow into being a true CRO. You have to have the the op, the the real operational rigor. You have to be incredibly data driven, and you have to, you know, have that cadence um, where you where you're where you're able to scale something because you are an operator. And I'd, I'd say that's the type of person who can grow into the CRO. Mm -hmm. If you've got somebody who is, you know great at doing deals, but not necessarily on the scale and the operations, then probably do not make them your CRO um, is, would, would be the general guidance that I would get. In terms of growing them into it, yeah, I think it's a matter of, I, I'm, I fundamentally believe, again, if you hire learners, um, you just, if you expose them to all the right things, you can, you can have them grow into any job. And so one of the things that I like to do is, um, as a president, both at Splunk and, and now, of course, just arriving at Okta, um, I'll do monthly operating reviews with each function. So marketing will have an operating review every month. Sales, sales of course, has an operating review every month. And, and customer success has an operating review every month. Um, but I have the leaders, at, not only the, the top level leaders of each of the functions, but we invite the next level leaders to join. So they actually see the operating cadence and they start to understand what's important to all of the levers of go to market rather mm -hmm. than just understanding 
you know, their particular focus, they need to understand all the dials of the business to see how the, the whole machine works together. So really exposing people to, you know, what you inspect and, and, and how other parts of the business is run mm -hmm. is, I think, the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. How about, um, um, you know, this is probably a tricky question with no obvious general answer, but with respect to like uh, compensation, um, you know, it's pretty easy to, to, to think about compensating salespeople on a commission basis for, you know, bringing in new business. But um, uh, any thoughts on how you've, you know, you'd recommend company structure, um, uh, you know, performance oriented compensation for, for example, like a success team, you know, should it be based on renewal rates? Um, should, should should sales comp have a long tail to it for customers that continue to renew? How, any, any thoughts there? Because I know a lot of companies struggle with this. Yeah, I think at the beginning, it's, it's very natural just to, to comp your sales uh, organization on, on, you know, the bookings. Um, and in the beginning, maybe not hold them as accountable for um, the renewal and have have or sorry, for the adoption and renewal and have that be a customer success focus. But over time, um, and, and I would say not too, not too late, um, you know, even maybe by the time you're a hundred million dollars, I would say you need to pay the, your, your reps on, on the net, on the, on mm -hmm. the net amount. So, you know, if, if you have a, a customer or if you have a, a rep who is, you know, losing money over in this account, because they they either sold it wrong or didn't sell the right amount of services with it or didn't pay attention to the customer, and then they're just moving on to sell another customer, um, you can't reward that rep. I mean, that's bad behavior, and it's behavior that's going to take the company down. So in the end, you should be paying the reps an incremental, and you should be paying the, the renewal reps, uh, which focus specifically on the renewal, based upon the at-bat renewals. And the reason I say at-bat, meaning what's actually up for renewal, because mm -hmm. you see a lot of people playing games where if they're, if the churn is, um, if the churn and they have a leaky bucket within a quarter, they may pull forward some renewals, but you have to be really careful about making sure you measure that the right way mm -hmm. because your renewal rate should be based upon what is up, up for renewal that quarter. Right. And pulling forward something from the next quarter is a game that can be played and you have to be careful not to miss that. Got it. So anything you can do to stop, stop the bucket from leaking. Yes. <laughs> um, exactly. So I want to pull in uh, the product discipline again and just talk a little bit about how to think about, you know, sales versus product. Um, you know, another common theme we see in, in, in our in our portfolio and, and know that this is the case when when speaking with other founders that something they struggle with is is this you know, natural tension that, that tends to arise between a company that's going to market and has hired, you know, a, a professional go-to-market team. And that go-to-market team is out there trying to close business. And oftentimes we'll come back and say, you know, if, if we just add this feature or that feature, um, we're going to, we're going to make our quarter, we're going to get this account, we're going to blow the number away. Um, and on the same, but at the same time, a lot of times those features are not necessarily things that are prioritized on a roadmap, may not be repeatable, uh, you know, may not matter to more than one customer and may not even matter at all, maybe sort of a figment of sales imagination as to whether or not it's really going to help close a deal. Um, how, I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with this a lot in your career. How, how, how should a, a founder or a leader of a startup, you know, try to, try to um, manage that type of conflict and arbitrate between product and go to market when it, when it arises? Yeah, so it's another interlink, just like I talked about sales and marketing, product and, and sales is equally as important uh, to make sure that you're on the same page. And generally speaking, you can't you can't um, pay attention to customer one-off asks. If you do that, again, particularly in a SaaS model, you're you're going to um, you're going to have a hard time in uh, getting the product to where it needs to be if you're constantly veering away from your roadmap. And, and you know, trying to appease one-off asks from customers. Now that said, part of your customer success motion has to be making sure that you're always keeping track of what's being asked for because it may be that something is a broad need across the customer base that wasn't on the roadmap. So that's that's when you should, you know, feel like you want to add something because you're seeing that you missed something that is a broad need for the customer. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I remember early on uh, at Salesforce being with Mark at a, at a big financial services customer. 
And we were, you know, working on, we had been working on an opportunity there and they basically told Mark, and this was, you know, early days, our ASP was probably, you know, 65, 70 K at that time. Mm-hmm. There was a, cust- a big FinServe customer that offered Mark $5 million if he would give them their own instance. And at that point he said, clearly we haven't done our jobs uh, well mm-hmm. enough here yet. You don't understand the the value of multi-tenant and all the reasons why multi-tenant is not only good for us, but really good for you. And he said, we need to educate you more and I'll, and you can give me that $5 million when we do our the right job in educating you. So, that's, that's incredible discipline. Obviously he, you know, had a belief system and stuck with it um, and didn't, you know, didn't take the short term fix. Now, you know, 5 million then would have probably really moved the needle. Today, that's like a minute's worth of revenue at Salesforce. <laughs> so true. It's so true. Well, Susan, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much for sharing uh, your, uh, uh, just the tip of the iceberg of all the wisdom that you carry around with respect to building businesses and how to, how to ma- manage go to market exceptionally well uh, with this group. I know everybody's uh, taken a lot away from from this and uh, really appreciate your support of uh, GGV and the broader uh, uh, startup community. So thanks. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Glenn. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you.